You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have uh, Vincent A. Fischetti. He's at Rockefeller University in New York. Uh, he runs the Fischetti Lab, his namesake. And they look at the evolution of uh, bacteria killing viruses, known as phages, and uh, other bacterial uh, attributes. So, Vince, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what, what spurred your interest in uh, bacteria and phages, and how long have you been working with them? Well, I've been working with phages almost my whole career in one way or another. <clears throat> I, um, I, cut, I started my, my first job here at Rockefeller working on bacteriophages and looking for um, uh, toxins that bacteriophage carry into certain organisms. And that's how I got started with, with phage themselves. And then uh, later on in my career, I came back to it um, because of the problem with resistance. And uh, resistance happens to be a, a serious problem these days. It wasn't 20 years ago when, when our, the pro, this particular project started, but it's gotten worse and worse. About 20 years ago, uh, when we re- realized that, re- that resistance was a, a serious problem, um, we were looking for alternatives to kill bacteria. And since I was working with phage, and at the time, I was also working with phage license, and these are the enzymes that the phage used to get out of a bacteria. So basically what happens is a, a, a phage is a virus that infects bacteria only. And when they infect the bacteria, they replicate in the bacteria. And when they complete that replication, 20 minutes to an hour, um, where one phage has gone in, 100 have been replicated. So now those phage have to get out of the organism. They're trapped inside the bacteria. So they produce an enzyme that drills a hole in the cell wall. And since bacteria are, are under a lot of pressure, that hole in the cell wall that maintains the pressure causes the bacteria to, to burst, uh, releasing the, the, the phage progeny to now start a new cycle and infect new organisms. So what we've done is we've taken that enzyme that punches the hole from the inside and we've purified it, produce it in, in recombinant bacteria. And when you add that purified enzyme from the outside, it does precisely what it did from the inside. It punches a hole in the wall. The membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane that's inside the bacteria comes out. The organism explodes and it kills them instantly. So we can kill millions of organisms within seconds. Um, just a quick definition of terms. So when you talk about resistance, we, you mean antibiotic biotic resistance, yes? Correct. Antibiotic resistance, yes. Okay. And then phages, do they, morphologically, do they look like traditional viruses, you know, with like a octagonal head and arms and exactly. how do they compare to regular viruses that affect people let's say um they, they they may look the same um viruses that infect humans don't really have tails to any great degree they usually uh, icosahedral structures that have receptors on their surface that can interact with mammalian cells whereas bacteriophage uh, many bacteriophage have tails and tail fibers and I'm a little more sophisticated in that regard to attach to a, a specific bacteria. And then they use that tail to inject their DNA into the bacterial host. And that then that DNA then takes over the, the host cell. So they they look a little bit differently mm-hmm. because they have to get into a, a bacterial cell that has a, an, a surface wall structure. And that's a little more challenging than just getting into a, a mammalian membrane. So why do we have uh antibiotic resistance what you know like what do the bacteria do that uh, you know prevents them from being killed by a given antibiotic well you have to remember that most bac- 
uh, most antibiotics have come from soil organisms. And the reason why there are antibiotics in the soil is that these organisms use these what called antibiotics to control their environment. There are millions and millions of organisms in the soil and in water and other places, but I'll use soil as an example. So they need to, to produce these antibiotics to control their environment so they can keep other bacteria from taking over. And all we've done is taken advantage of these antibiotics to kill the bacteria we want to kill. So since bacteria have been exposed to antibiotics for millions and millions of years, they've developed ways to get around it because you know a bacteria that gets killed from a particular antibiotic, well, he's going to be eliminated from the soil in, in a normal environment. So a bacteria that has now developed resistance can now survive in that soil environment. We're just taking the antibiotic out of the soil organisms and using it for our own purposes, but the bacteria still remember how to become resistant because they they have these genes and these uh, other particles that allow resistance to occur. So they happen, they happen because there's a lot of antibiotic in the soil and now we also add huge quantities of antibiotic to farm animals to fatten them up. And we've been using tons and tons of antibiotics to treat animals uh, for food products. And therefore, we've exposed soil bacteria to a lot of antibiotics, and therefore, they become more resistant. Well, I've also heard, too, that uh, I guess when people take antibiotics, um, you know, they'll urinate and uh, all that excretion gets goes to water treatment plants and may then be recycled. The antibiotic parts may be recycled in our drinking water. That may also be contributing to an antibiotic load on us in addition to animals that we would eat. That's a very minor component of, of resistance. The major component is that the tons of antibiotic are, are used in farm animals for, uh, for food products to fatten them up. If we don't use antibiotics, the mm-hmm. animals don't get fat and uh, the farmers make less money. So they use lots of antibiotic to keep them uh, healthy and, and, and fat. So that uh, the, the little bit of antibiotic okay. that we take and we urinate is, is a minor component in that. What about antibiotics that someone would take, you know, when they get sick? And if they've taken various antibiotics 10 times in a given period of years, you know, how much of a factor is that for them personally? It's, it's a small factor. Again, it's, uh, it's, that's not the, the major factor. It, it does play a role. But the antibiotics we use for for um, for food products is is the major role in in producing huh. resistance, and that or that's trying to be curtailed. Um, the 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 farm farmers and and veterinary um, companies that that use this this method have been um, really been on on the um, message to reduce their antibiotic use. So now they're going to alternatives to antibiotics to try to treat these animals with different things to to fatten them up rather than using antibiotics. Okay. And what are some of the mechanisms by which bacteria acquire resistance to antibiotics? Um, they could do it by um, changing their genes to a certain way and in, in, in which they, they could prevent the, um, the antibiotic from getting in. They can change their cell wall. So these genes will... Could, control the cell wall of the bacteria, these outer structure, and if they make it thicker, uh, the antibiotic can't get in properly. They could make um, molecules that when an antibiotic gets in, it gets pumped out, and that, that another mechanism. They could change their, the, the actual target receptor of that antibiotic. When an antibiotic goes in and targets a particular um, metabolic gene or, or certain gene to, to kill the organism, they can mutate that gene so the antibiotic doesn't work anymore. So there are various strategies in which uh, bacteria can change uh, their um, their ability to become sensitive to the antibiotic. And how fast can they do some of these things in the presence of an antibiotic? Well, in some cases, if they if they need to do it themselves, for example, they need to change the gene in their own genome uh, to become resistant. It could take you know several iterations to become resistant enough. So they're constantly exposed. It could take f- several years before you finally get to a, a point where an organism is highly resistant. 
to a particular antibiotic. But if in these soil organisms, since they've seen antibiotics constantly in high concentrations, some of these organisms produce uh, what's called plasmids or bacteriophage, the viruses we're talking about. And these plasmids, which are small pieces of DNA or the bacteriophage, can pick up resistance genes. These are genes that have the capability of the, the resistance capabilities that I've just told you about. And they could transmit these genes right away to another organism. So you can have an organism that is highly sensitive to an antibiotic. And now a phage or a plasmid comes into that organism that has this resistance gene. And now instantly that organism has, has become resistant to, the, to that antibiotic, as opposed to an organism that has to acquire the, the antibiotic slowly and slowly, and it take, may take years for it to become resistant. And now we're seeing a lot of these extra chromosomal uh, 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 genetic uh, molecules like plasmids or bacteriophage that could cause this to, to occur very, very rapidly. So some phages can endogenize their uh, genetic material into a bacteria, just like viruses do that for humans? Absolutely. Yep. They can, they can transfer genes from, from one organism to another organism. It's called transduction. So they can, they can carry the gene in their, in their capsid head. And then when they inject that DNA into, into the host organism, they, they, they transfer that, that information from one organism to the next very rapidly. That's amazing. Yeah. So what's the goal of your research? Is it purely to look at how to use lysine to fight bacterial infections or is it to, you know, figure out how to cultivate and manipulate phages so that they can selectively kill bacterial infections? Well, I don't work with, with, with using phage to kill bacteria. That's, that's a whole industry in itself. And it was used before antibiotics were discovered. So before antibiotics were discovered, phage were discovered. And at that time, there was no other way to kill bacteria except phage that, that was discovered uh, early on in, uh, well, in the, in the early 1900s. So the um, European, Eastern European countries were using phage therapy as a way to control bacterial infections. And in this country, in the early 1940s, um, we were starting to, uh, in fact, Pfizer was starting a facility here in Brooklyn or in Queens to to raise or produce phage for phage therapy. And just around that time, antibiotics were discovered. And so Pfizer shifted their their direction from phage therapy to antibiotic uh, therapy. And the United States and and the uh, Western countries were were using antibiotics to control infections, whereas the Eastern Bloc countries, Russia and and, uh, Eastern Bloc uh, countries were using bacteriophage as a way to control infection. Well, over the years, uh, antibiotics became more uh, proficient. They, were, they worked better. And so the, 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 most of the world is using antibiotics as a way to control bacterial infections. But now we're in a point where we see a lot of resistance. So we're going back to our roots in bacteriophage. And some people are now using phage therapy as a way to control bacterial infections. We've now taken the other route. We're using the purified enzyme that is the ultimate kill. That's what ultimately kills the bacteria. So we're using that purified enzyme as a therapeutic, as an alternative to antibiotics. So your focus is on the lysins that are created by the, uh, the phages, or released Correct. by them. Correct. And we've been doing this for about 20 years now. Uh, oh, we, wow. we published the first paper uh, in about 2000, where we were the first to take a phage lysin and treat an animal that was infected with a streptococcus and shown that we could remove the organism by treating them with the, uh, with the lysin. And then we published several papers immediately after that and shown that we could do it in a variety of ways. We published a paper in anthrax and we published a paper in pneumococcal pneumonia uh, infection. I'm sorry, it was a pneumococcal inf- uh, nasal colonization. And those are the first three papers uh, yeah. That, that showed that you could use lysins as a therapeutic in, in uh, animals, at least. So, yeah, are lysins selective to bacterial cells, and can you make them selective to particular bacteria? They are so very selective. They're unlike antibiotics, which kill a wide spectrum of bacteria. 
that are considered broad spectrum. Antibiotics are considered more, more broad spectrum in their ability to kill. Lysins are more narrow spectrum. Uh, they kill the organism you wish to target. And that was probably one of the reasons why uh, the development of lysins was very slow early on because the pharmaceutical companies wanted broad spectrum antibiotics. They didn't want narrow spectrum antibiotics. But now things have changed 20 years later we're looking at more narrow spectrum antibiotics because of issues in killing the good organisms in, in, in combination with the bad organisms. Why wouldn't they want narrow spectrum? I mean, then they could theoretically get a patent on 20 different flavors of lysin and go after 20 different conditions. Yeah, the, the problem originally was that you needed broad spectrum because it, if an individual is, is, uh, has an infection and goes to a hospital, uh, they don't know the organism that's causing the infection. So, and it takes, the diagnostics takes a couple of days before you actually know the organism that's causing the infection. That was 20 years ago. So you needed a broad spectrum antibiotic to be treated initially until they figured out what the organism was and what its sensitivity was. And then they would tr treat you then with the narrow, more narrow spectrum antibiotic. But now the diagnostics have come to a point where within a matter of hours, we can identify many of the organisms that cause infection. And therefore, you, we can treat now with more narrow spectrum drugs. But then it wasn't that case. So are you getting renewed interest now from pharmaceutical companies asking you to craft a specific uh, license for them? I wish. <laughs> They're still a little resistant. But we have now, um, one of our enzymes has now completed a phase two clinical trials, which means it went, in, it went to phase one, which is just safety, and then phase two which is in hospital. And this, this one enzyme that we used was to treat um, staph infections in hospitals, staph bacteremia, that means staph in the blood, uh, these blood infections of staphylococci. And they were treated with uh, standard of care antibiotics plus lysin and compared to patients that just received standard of care antibiotic. And the phase two study were 116 patients. And it showed clearly that the patients that got the combination of antibiotic and lysin uh, did better, 46% of them, 46% uh, better than those that received um, antibiotic alone. Uh, they left the hospital sooner and they had fewer relapses. So based on the phase two data, FDA then approved the move, movement of lysin now into phase three, which is... At, which is the, the first alternative to antibiotic to ever achieve uh, this milestone, this FDA milestone. No other antibiotic alternative has ever gotten this far. They've usually yeah. never gotten no. to phase two or they failed before they got there. What about um, can, bacterial, can bacteria develop resistance to lysin? We haven't seen it yet. For 20 years, we've been uh, working with these enzymes and, that, and over the 20 years, other Many other uh, laboratories have been working with phase license. It's, it's now a, a, a burgeoning a field. And a lot of people have tried to find resistance to license, and they haven't found any resistance yet. In order for an organism to become resistant, they would have to remodel their cell wall. And that's a very difficult task for them to achieve. So it would take um, many decades for that to occur. And by then, we would figure out other ways to kill bacteria. So what, what are some of the nuances of lysins that you've learned over 20 years? I mean, you spent a lot of time with them. Like, any insights into the mechanism by which they literally, do they, you know, how do they punch holes in a cell wall? Do they drill through? Do they absorb part of the wall and make it more porous? Like, you know, what are some of the insights you've got? Well, they're basically enzymes, and enzymes cleave bonds. And that's basically what it's doing. It's the, and they're, now there are enzymes against two types of, of bacteria. You have... The major bacteria in, uh, out in the world um, are two basic types. There are the gram-positive organisms and the gram-negative organisms. There are certainly other uh, types of bacteria, but the great majority are either gram-positive or gram-negative. And the gram-positive organisms are like the staphylococci, the streptococci, uh, the pneumococci. Those are organisms that have a very thick cell wall, and it's called the peptidoglycan. It's a, it's a cross-linked structure that is produced by the bacteria because the bacteria are under a very high amount of pressure. They're under about 15 atmospheres of pressure. 
So they are in a lot of pressure. So that really? wall has to be very thick to maintain that pressure. And the, the enzyme, the lysin, cleaves the bonds in the cell wall that keep that, that, that structure together. And all you need to do is cleave a few bonds. And the pressure is so great that the, that the cell wall will just explode, releasing the phage. The oh, so you don't need the, uh, do you need a directional cleaving, you know, like in from in to out through the wall or it just, again, the structural integrity is so on a knife's edge that you just cleave enough of a bonds in an area and the thing blows open. Exactly. Your one bond may not do it, but you may have to cleave two, three, four bonds and that's sufficient to cause the, the, the explosion at that site. And we have videos, uh, that, that, that you can show this very easily. We can take organisms, put them under a microscope, add a little enzyme, and you can see them literally explode within seconds. Wow, that's those, crazy. Those are, the, those are the gram-positive organisms. Then the gram-negatives on the other side are organisms that are under a very little amount of pressure. There are about two atmospheres of pressure. So they don't need um, an enzyme that will... will uh, they need a different type of enzyme, let's put it this way, because their cell wall... Is, is, is constructed a bit differently. They have an outer membrane where the gram positive doesn't have an outer membrane and they have an inner membrane. The gram negative and gram positive both have inner membranes. But since they're not under a lot of pressure, the peptidoglycan structure, that thick structure in the gram positive is very thin in the gram negative. So the gram negative enzymes are designed to destroy that outer membrane, which can also maintain the structure of the, of the organism. And it also have a catalytic domain that cleaves the peptidoglycan. So that's a little more complex in that it has to cleave, destroy the outer membrane that keeps the molecule and the organism intact and the peptidoglycan that, that maintains that two, two pounds of, of pressure, or two atmospheres of pressure, sorry. Why would the uh, gram-positive bacteria have such high pressure inside of their cell wall? Um, I don't think it's really known... Uh, why it's just a matter of the salts and the and the uh, the nature of the, the molecules that are in the cytoplasm that results in that much that much pressure but i don't think it's clearly understood the the, the real difference between the, the 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 pressures inside these organisms what about our human eukaryotic cells are they high pressure or low pressure no, they're, they're low pressure they're more like the gram okay. negative yeah huh Interesting. And what are the gram positive versus the gram negative known for? What's the, the major distinction? Distinction well, out there? The, Do they types, the types of, of infections they they cause? The gram positive organisms cause one set of ex, uh, infections. They, um, um, the, as I said, they're like the, the pneumococcus, the staphylococcus, um, the uh, listeria. Uh, whereas the gram negative organisms, the Salmonella, Shigella, Pseudomonas. Um, and it, it really depends on treatment, how people are treated, the types of antibiotics that are out there, as to which organisms tend to be more uh, of a problem in the hospital as opposed to other organisms. For example, uh, 20, 25 years ago, the gram-positive organisms were the major problems. They were the staphylococci and the pneumococci that were causing many of the infections in hospitals. And that, and because we've developed uh, antibiotics against the gram positives in those days that were very efficient. The uh, the control of those organisms were quite good, and now the gram negative organisms are now becoming more prevalent in hospitals. So more of the direction to develop anti infectives are against the gram negative organisms such as Pseudomonas, uh, Klebsiella, um, Acidobacter, and many of those organisms are resistant to multiple antibiotics. They, some of the acinetobacter organisms, for example, are resistant to every known antibiotic that we have. And if you get infected by one of those organisms, there really is nothing we can do. You have to resort to either a, a new therapeutic like a lysin or, or phage therapy. So um, when we get a bacterial infection, I would think that phages are always present, you know, but I guess sometimes the, what the phages are just not effective in clearing the bacteria from us. Like, why would we have an infection that kills us? How come phages wouldn't come in and take care of it? Well, because you'd, you'd have to have a, the specific phage for that organism, and phage are very specific. So if you wanted to use phage therapy, you'd have to use a combination of phage uh, against a particular organism in order to kill 
the organism that is causing infection. Uh, it's, there are so many phage on Earth, but, but they're highly specific for the organism it wants to kill. So the problem is that you're not, you're, even though we're exposed to phage all the time, uh, we're not exposed to the right phage to kill the organism that's causing the infection. In fact, you know, we, uh, if we detected the presence of any any level of phages that would kill a given bacteria that's within us, or are there are situations where they were completely absent any of those phages. In general, we're probably completely absent to those phages because it's very rare to find. Even though we, we're let's put it this way, we are exposed to thirty billion phage every day. We eat phage and drink phage every day. And there was a recent publication showing that 30 billion phage pass through our intestinal tract every day. But if you had an infection, you'd have to get at least one phage that would infect and one of those organisms that's causing the infection. And it would take a long time for those phage to then infect that organism they would then release progeny, and then those progeny would infect the other organisms that are causing the infection, and then that would continue. It would take a long time for a single phage to, to actually cure you. You'd probably die before that would occur. So what you would have to do is, to, if for phage therapy to work, is you have to have a high concentration of phage, because when you're infected, you have a high concentration of bacteria that are causing the infection, and you want to get rid of them fairly quickly. So even though you may be exposed to a phage that might infect an organism that is infecting you, it's just not enough to wipe out all the organisms that are causing the infection. Understand? How specific? Yeah, I understand. And well, I was wondering because I wonder if you know if someone's sick, if you could uh, harvest some of their bacteria and there'd be phages along with it. Maybe they weren't numerous numerous enough to you know stop that person's infection, but then maybe you could quickly find that you know bacteria specific lysin that those phages were using, even though they weren't successful, and then cultivate that and treat the person. So this leads into my question, which I was going to ask you anyway, is how specific are the lysins, and how do you find new ones for the kind of bacteria that you want to go after? Okay, unlike the, the, the phage themselves that are very specific for certain strains of organisms. <clears throat> so, for example, if you have a, uh, an infection by a staphylococcus, there are different kinds of staphylococcus. They change their receptors on the surface. So a phage that infects one staphylococcus may not infect another staphylococcus. So that's why you need a cocktail of phage to kill all staphylococci. On the other side, if you use lysins, a lysin will kill all staphylococci. So if you, if you develop one batch of lysin, that lysin will kill thousands, different thousands of, of, of types of staphylococci that we've tested that are out in the environment causing infections from uh, the United States to Europe and what have you. Whereas on the other side, if you had to use phase therapy for that, you would have to constantly change the cocktail for it to kill the staphylococci that are causing infections worldwide. So lysins have a more broad activity against the narrow species of organisms. So therefore, when we okay. develop a lysin against staph, that, that lysin will be used worldwide for staphylococci. We would then have to develop an enzyme against pneumococci for that lysin to kill all pneumococci. So it's targeted killing, but it would kill all the organisms in the species that you're looking for. Hmm. So how many lysins have, have you developed? And I mean, how many more to go for all the major bacteria that people encounter? So far, we've developed lysins against every a uh, gram-positive organism that causes infection. And we've now developed gram-negative enzymes against the major pathogens that are causing infections right now. The problem is that uh, they have to be developed. It takes a lot of money to develop each one of them. It takes millions and millions of dollars to develop each one of these enzymes. So if a, a Contrafect is, an, is a con company that has licensed our staphylococcal enzyme, and they've developed the one a staph lysin for use against uh, MRSA bacteremia or staph bacteremia in hospitals. And that's the one that has gotten to phase three. Uh, we have a number of enzymes that uh, the university owns uh, for, for development. We can't develop them because it costs too much money to do that. Have you noticed any patterns? You said for all the gram positive bacteria, you've, you've figured out the enzymes. Any patterns there? And then 
in the gram negative as well? Um, patterns in, in, in what regard? Maybe the structure of the enzyme. Is there a base type that has certain you know functional groups added onto it, and that comprises any lysine that you would need for gram positive? Just it's pure speculation, but I don't yeah. even know if you could say. But how different are the lysines? How different are the enzymes? Are they similar or not? Well, in the gram positive enzymes, they they have a, a particular structure. They have uh, two domains. They have a, a a catalytic domain, and that's the part that cleaves the peptidoglycan. And those could be about four or five different types of enzymes that cleave four or five different bonds in the peptidoglycan. So that is a pattern because it, uh, they're, they're either amidases or glucosaminidases. These are enzymes that cleave sugars and the peptidoglycan is made up of sugar. So these are, are uh, enzymes that cleave particular sugars that are found in the peptidoglycan. On the other side of the molecule is what's called a binding domain. And that is um, um, a region that binds to a, a, a structure in the peptidoglycan, and it binds to that structure at high affinity. And the reason for that high affinity binding is that the phage, when the phage lyses, it doesn't want its lysin to, to be released in the environment to potentially kill a host organism. The phage would rather infect that organism rather than have its enzyme kill that organism. So it designed the organism, the enzyme to bind at high affinity. So when the lysis occurs, the enzyme stays bound with the bacterial cell wall debris and is not released in the environment to kill potential hosts. So really? those two domains are very clear in their function for the enzyme to work. It's crazy. How would the phage... So huh. why would the phage care once it had... had you finished using a cell and blowing it open and releasing its progeny. Why would it care about the enzyme killing another one? Another well, host? I guess it, 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 does it care about, okay, so I guess there's two environments. There's the other bacteria that are candidates for it to go attack and to further spread itself. And then there's the everything else. So are you saying that the phage appears to have designed the license to only selectively, literally kill the bacteria that it's targeting and not the other bacteria, or exactly. the lysin also is somehow targeted not to affect other any any other organism that's in the area? <clears throat> no, it doesn't want to kill the organism that it has just killed, the type of organism, the very type. It's that's very narrow because that's the nature of the, fi- of the virus, because the virus infects that organism, and therefore... It's very rare that the or, that that the um, the phage will find a host organism, so it doesn't want to take a chance that the enzyme will kill that host organism, because once that that organism is dead, then the phage has a problem. If it doesn't find another host, it's going to hang around for a long time until that host comes around, and so therefore it doesn't want to take a chance that 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 host organism is killed. It, it, for no reason at all. It's rather have the opportunity for a phage to kill that host than, than the enzyme killing it. So it's, it's designed that way uh, because it wants, the phage wants to survive to some degree. In the whole scheme about, of phage, okay. nobody wants to win this war. Phage don't want to win the war and the bacteria don't want to win the war. They both have to work together in this, in this, on this earth in order for them to both to survive. The phage need the bacteria to grow in, and the bacteria need the phage to to take in uh, random DNA for them to evolve fast enough to survive on Earth. And that's how they work together. This is crazy. Yeah, I'm just I'm just amazed by this. Um, does the phage also just selectively blow open? Can it blow open the bacteria in such a way that the bacteria is not in pieces all over the place, but just maybe? Uh, a hole blows open in it, so like the, the shell, it can still inhabit if it needs. Does, it, does that happen, or it just blows the thing open, pieces fly everywhere, and it moves on? It's usually a hole. Um, if the first thing explodes, it's usually a hole, and then the, the cell wall collapses. It ends up as an empty bag um, of, of a, a dead bacteria. That's what it is. It, the, the, it's like a, I, I view it like a water balloon. So the water, the balloon itself is the cell, the bacterial cell wall. And the, and the water is the cytoplasm, the gene, the, the genes, the DNA, everything in the cytoplasm. When the hole is punched in that balloon, 
the, the water squirts out, the cytoplasm squirts out, the DNA squirts out, and what's left behind is the is the balloon itself or the cell wall. And that you can't put the two together. Once the explosion occurs, you can't use the shell and you can't use the the whatever came out of that shell. Uh, they're both gone and get degraded with uh, soil enzymes or water enzymes or what have you. It's a dead organ. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. And then you said that um, bacteria themselves produce phages. I mean, they produce plasmids, but they produce phages. I mean, morphologically or in, in terms of function, do these phages that are produced by bacteria how similar are they to phages that would attack them? Well, well, the bacteria, they don't produce phage. They're infected by phage, and then the phage are produced inside that bacteria. So, okay, but uh, if you look at a plasmid, is that very similar to a phage, or is it completely different? It's just a, the bacteria's mechanism of transferring you know, information to other bacteria. A plasmid is, in a sense, a very simple phage in some ways. It's just a, a circular piece of DNA. And so is a phage, a circular piece of DNA. Once the DNA gets into a cell, the phage, the phage DNA gets into a cell, it's a circular piece of DNA that then takes over the cell for production of new virus particles. A plasmid is a circular piece of DNA with all that, without the, all the extra stuff to produce a phage particle. It's, it's basically genes. It's just, it's just transmitted in a different way. But there are okay. also, yeah. I, I, we didn't get into it, but they're all, we're not talking, uh, this is not a, maybe not a discussion about phage, but there's a whole separate uh, type of phage, and that's a lysogenic phage. And that's a phage, we were just talking about lytic phages. These are phages that go in, replicate, and kill the organism. But they also have phage that go in, but incorporate themselves into the genome of the bacteria. So now they're part of the bacterial genome, and they stay there very quietly, as the bacteria replicate into two bacteria, four bacteria, the, the phage are still there in the genome. That's still part of the bacterial genome until such time as the, the bacteria um, become threatened that they're going to die, that they're under stress of some kind. And then the phage that are sitting in their genome say, this bacteria is going to die. I better get, I better get out of here. So then they come out of the, the genome of the bacteria, they replicate and then kill that bacteria so they can get out there in the world. Because if the bacteria died with the bacteria with the bacteriophage genome still in that bacteria, that phage is gone forever. So they have a sure. very interesting system where they can incorporate themselves into the bacterial host and stay there for many, many generations until such time as they decide to come out and kill that bacteria, but now release their, their, their phage progeny to start to infect other bacteria. That's amazing. I wonder if uh, they alter, you know, if a bacteria has an endogenized phage, and then another phage comes to prey on it, if that, you know, endogenous one fights against the other phage that's coming oh, they for do. it. Or is it yeah, they do. They have, what the, what the guy that, got, that went in produces molecules that prevent any other phage, similar phage, from getting in and also doing the same thing. So they produce molecules that just prevent that from happening. But if it's a different phage and they don't have the uh, what's called the resistance genes to prevent these from happening, then another phage can come in. So you can have a bacteria like Streptococcus and Staphylococci that are lysogenized, have phage in their genome, four, five, six, seven, eight different phage sitting in their genomes. And the reason for that is that each one of those phages that come in can carry resistance genes genes that allow them to, to survive in an environment much better, uh, virulence genes to allow them to, to cause an infection much more efficiently, uh, produce enzymes that can d destroy tissue. So having phage are a good thing because the phage are out there infecting all kinds of organisms, picking up genes as they're doing this. And then when they go into, a, into a, an organism like a staff, they can take all that that they've learned out there in the environment and take all that information genetic information into a disease organism. And now you have a super organism that has the capability of causing really serious infection. And that's how these things occur. That's why suddenly you have a, 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 an outbreak of a highly diseased organism. And that's because they've, they've picked up either a plasmid who's been out there picking up genes or a phage or lysogenic phage that have picked up genes that have now brought those genes into an organism that can now cause disease 
and made it into a superbug. And that superbug has, has picked up a phage or a plasmid that have been accumulating over a long time in the environment. And now it has acquired it almost instantly in one fell swoop. That's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy huh. stuff. But that's, that's why we're in the situation we are right now, where organisms are resistant to multiple antibiotics. They didn't do it on their own. They picked them up because of plasmids coming in or phage coming in and giving them this capability. And because those phage have been out there in the soil and different places where phage are resistant, they pick up these resistance genes and they sort of carry them around with them until they happen to get into the right organism, the right organism or the wrong organism, as far as we're concerned. And, and that organism is disease organism. And that organism has all the capabilities of causing an infection. And now you add to it the ability to have the, a bunch of resistance genes that have suddenly come in. Now you have a serious problem on your hands. And that's, yeah, that's amazing. Mm. So the, a, 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 an event can occur in the future, near future, far future, in which an organism can come in and cause a pandemic that can cause very serious infection, distribute very rapidly in an environment that can spread from person to person. And that's how these pandemics occur, because organisms pick up resistance genes or capabilities that they never had before through, the, through viruses or bacteriophage, and then they could become superbugs very quickly. So do you carry around any vials of lysine in case you ever get sick? <laughs> no, I'd have to have the right lysine against the right organism. So not no, really, no. No. But we're hoping that it, it's not going to be the answer to everything. But lysins will certainly help in situations where we have highly resistant organisms causing serious infections. We can use this alternative to kill those organisms. And the lysin appears to be protective against the rest of the, you know, the, the person's microbiome, or at least selective. Yeah. So it, it won't disturb it, right? Yeah, they won't disturb it as much as an antibiotic. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. Huh. I guess this could be tweaked perhaps to um, you know, maybe attack cancer cells if you could look at their surface membranes and identify particulars that would be amenable to lysins that could affect, you know, cancer cells that could be used for that possibly, who knows? Well, let's not think of it that way. Let's think of it as enzyme therapy. So there are enzymes, there are billions and billions of enzymes out there in the environment that do various things. We just have to find the right enzyme for the right job. So I found an enzyme that punches a hole in a bacteria. The phage happened to be making it. But there are enzymes in the soil that bacteria have been making um, for other purposes, for purposes to break down certain bonds. If that bond that it's cleaving is the same bond on a cancer cell, then you might be able to use an enzyme to cleave that bond in a cancer cell if that bond is only found in a cancer cell and not found in a normal cell. Then you could use right. that. It's just thinking outside the box a little bit. Is it uh, possible to overdo a license treatment? blow too many holes or have the process happen too fast or no? That's an excellent question because what would happen if you took, let's say, use the example of a staphylococcus. So you're infected with a staphylococcus. The amount of enzyme we're using is to punch a couple of holes. The organism collapses and it basically is an empty bag. That empty bag will be cleared by our, our immune system. Our phagocytes will clear that and you shouldn't have much of a problem. But if you, if we used a lot of enzyme, then what would happen is we'd cut that cell wall into lots of little pieces. And those pieces are highly inflammatory. So we would make the situation worse. Because now, even though we're killing the organism, we're causing a a huge inflammatory response. And that can cause shock and other issues. But we're not using that amount of enzyme. The amount of enzyme we're using is just enough to punch a couple of holes in the organism, and then it would be cleared. But you're absolutely right. If we use too much enzyme, get too many pieces, and those pieces are very inflammatory, more, more so in the gram-negative organism, where the outer membrane is called lipopolysaccharide, and that's called endotoxin. And if you start releasing endotoxin in the body, you can cause highly inflammatory uh, uh, reactions that could be very, very serious. So you have to be very careful, even though we're using uh, an enzyme to kill these organisms, you have to use just enough enzyme just to kill the organism and not to, to destroy the organism. And that can be done. It is done. It has been done in this, in this one case of this strain 
uh, were killing these staph aureus in, in the hospital. We see no adverse events. The patients were, were, uh, were fine. They had no secondary problems with, uh, with the treatment. So it, it appeared to be quite safe in the, in the dose that we were using. I wonder if you could make uh, vaccines, bacteria-specific vaccines doing this. You know, you, you pre-lice a given bacteria, make it a bunch of fragments, then introduce it into a host, and maybe it causes a slight inflammatory response, but maybe then the host develops an immunity to that bacteria in the future. Uh, you're right again. I mean, that's, that's certainly a, a possible. We haven't looked at that uh, angle of it, but certainly what happens when you break these organisms into pieces, uh, and, and, you know, they're not they're large pieces. Uh, they are an immunogen. They are dead whole organisms. They're the outer shell, that is. And that could be an immunogen that would, would raise antibodies to the, to the organism that could protect you later on uh, against a similar type of infection. That's certainly possible. We haven't really gone that, down that, that road, uh, but it's certainly possible. So what, what's ahead with your work in the next few years? What do you think is going to be like the big focus for you? Right now, um, we've, we've spent about 18 years, 19 years working on the gram-positive license. We've just begun working on the gram-negative enzymes. Uh, they have some, uh, uh, some work to do because those enzymes work quite well, um, but they only work um, topically. Um, they don't work in serum. Uh, they have a structure, a charge structure on them that allows them to destroy the outer membrane. And that structure um, allows the enzyme to begin activated when it sees serum proteins. So we can't use them to treat bacteremias and uh, infections of, of the blood or, or infections that can be treated through the blood. They can be used for burn, burn patients, uh, lung, inf lung infections, wound infections, skin infections, uh, decolonization of, of uh, mucous membranes, but they can't be used as an injectable because they become inactivated. So we're now trying to understand more about these enzymes and how we could perhaps get around that problem. We need to develop now enzymes against more of the gram-negative pathogens and just learn more about them because the more we learn, the more we're able to modify them and make them better. Huh. And there's always these trade-offs and these challenges. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's no Is there anything that... The... Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I, you know, I could keep speculating with you, but I, I want to respect your time. Um, what, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Well, if, if you want to go through our papers, um, it's very easy if you go to Pub, PubMed. And if you type in Fischetti, F-I-S-C-H-E-T-T-I-V-A, then those are all our publications. There are no other Fischetti's, V-A Fischetti's that are uh, scientists that are doing this type of work. So those will be all our publications, there are about a couple of hundred of those. Uh, to, to really learn about what we do. That's great. Well, Vince, I really appreciate your time. It's been an awesome call. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.